So in our next class, we'll be talking about live loads. So before we get to that in class, I'd like to just describe some of the theory and also we'll do a quick example on live loads and structures. So first of all, basically anything that is not a dead load that's inside the building, that's what we call a live load. So that's what I mean by interior non-dead loads. They're based on use and occupancy. And basically what you do is you look them up in a table. I'll show you that here in just a minute. And the table in ASCE 7, it shows both an area load and a concentrated load. And what the specification says is that you have to use whichever produces the greater load effect. So whichever, for, for example, for a beam, whichever gives you the largest moment, that's what you use. So this is ASCE 7. This, these are the provisions here. This is on page 15. I'm just going to show you what it looks like. You've got this long table with different types of uses for buildings. Um, if, you're using, if you're talking about an office building, then we're looking at like 50 PSF for the uniform load, and then you go all the way over to the side here, and you can see the concentrated load. That's in kilonewton. That's in, I'm sorry, this is in pounds, so 2,000 pounds, 8.9 kilonewtons. That's what you'd use for a concentrated load. And I would mention too that you know, there, there is no such thing as a true point load. And so when they talk about the concentrated load, you actually, you're actually using an area that's 2.5 feet by 2.5 feet. Uh, we, won't do, we won't really use this much in class, but I just wanted you to be aware of that. We've talked about tributary area, right? It's whatever the area is that contributes to a structural member. Um, we use that with the area load, the uniform distributed loading. And this is where it gets this is where it gets most pertinent to live loads is that if you have a high tributary area, you've got a lot of area that that beam is supporting, it's very unlikely that the full load is going to be over that entire tributary area. And so what that allows you to do is you can actually reduce the live load when you're calculating the loading on that beam. And here's how you do it. So L is the live load that you'll be using. L naught is what you get from the table. And then you've got this term here, which allows you to reduce the live load. And I'll explain what's going on here. So, of course, L0, like I said, you get that from the table. Down here in this square root term, that's what's known as the influence area. And you take the tributary area, and then you multiply by this element factor here. And again, that's in a table in ASC7. And then, basically, this then reduces L0, and that's what you use for the live load. There are some restrictions on this. First of all, your influence area has to be at least 400 square feet. Otherwise, you cannot reduce the load at all. And the reason for that is that if you have something smaller than 400 square feet, there's a pretty good chance that you will have the full load on that. So the code doesn't let you reduce it at all. This next, this next aspect here, uh, we can't go, this basically says you can't go too low. So for instance, if you have a member supporting one floor, then the lowest you can go is 0.5 L0. And if it's supporting two or more floors, then you can go down to 0.4. So in other words, for a beam, typically, you can't go any less than 50% of the initial load. Um, for a column that supports two or more floors, you can go to, down to 40%, but, but no lower. And if you do the calculation and it's less than these values, then you basically just use that value. So for a beam, if it, got, if it was less than 0.5 L0, you would just use 0.5 L0. Um, the other thing is you cannot reduce any loads that are greater than 100 pounds per square foot. And I think the reason for that is because a lot of those types of loads, like for instance, if you look in ASCE 7, the load for a for the books in a library, like the stacks in a library, it's greater than 100 pounds. It's greater than 100 pounds per square foot. And you would expect in a library, they're probably going to try to, they're probably going to put in those books in that area and you will have that full live load over, or acting over the entire area. Uh, you can't reduce for passenger vehicle garages. The same kind of rationale here. It's very likely that you could have all of the vehicles, all of the all the parking spots in a garage being you know full with vehicles, and so we don't want to reduce the load. It is possible to get that full load. And then lastly, if it's an assembly area, those loads tend to be kind of high, but also there's also a great risk of life, and so we're not going to reduce live loads for assembly areas either. Okay, so let's look at, I've got an example here. And what we'll do is today in this video, we'll look at this part A here, and then we'll do B and C in class. We'll work on that in class. 
So I want to know, um, so this is an office building. It doesn't say exactly what is going on, it's like how the floor plan is is being used through the office building, whether it's whether it's hallways or offices. We'll just assume that we're using just an office live load on it. And we're going to calculate, we're going to calculate the live load on a typical interior beam. Okay, so if you come down here, um, I just chose, you can see here, I chose, let's see here, I guess I chose that beam right there. Here's the beam I'm using. Here's the tributary area. I go halfway on either side. It's 14 feet by 22 feet. And so you can see here, I'm calculating 308 square feet as the tributary area. Now I need to figure out what the influence area is. And so if you go into ASCE 7, it's this table right here, table 4.7-1. It's on page 17. And so again, I look at the, these, it tells you the different types of members. This is an interior beam. And so KLL is two. All right, sorry. So that's where this came from, right? That came from that table. You do that, it's 616 square feet. Now, you can see you know, that's greater than 400 square feet, so I can reduce the live load. So again, here's that equation from the specification. And if you look at this, what I like to do is go ahead and calculate this term here. So I plugged all the numbers in, that's 0 0.85. And the reason I do that is I just want to make sure I don't go lower than that lower bound. And so I'll just say, okay, so 0 0.85 is greater than 0 0.50. So we'll use L equal to 0 0.85 L naught. We can use that calculation. If I do that, if I do that calculation, so I've got L is equal to 0 0.85. Like I said, let's just use, assume this is office space, so that would be 50 PSF from the table. That gives you 42.7 pounds per square foot. Okay, and remember, that's not the answer, right? The answer is not a number. I need to show what is the loading on this beam. So like we've talked about in class, if I want to get, this will be a distributed load acting on that beam. If I want to get the distributed load acting on the beam, I multiply it by the tri tributary width. So W is equal to, let's just say, you know, it's that L times the tributary width, W sub T. Okay, so that's that 42, 42.7 pounds per foot squared. You know, this is what I'm calling WT up here times the 14 feet. So the distributed load acting on that beam, if you do that calculation, it's 598 pounds per foot. Okay, so again, we need a picture. So what that beam looks like, if I draw it out here, we'll assume it's simply supported based on the connection to the girder. And then I've got 500, 598 pounds per foot. And then if you wanted to, you could calculate the reactions. I did that that gives 6.58 kip reaction on either side. All right, and so that's the final answer right there. Again, we'll, we'll do the other examples in class, and that'll give you a little more practice on finding live load on structural members.